Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Janine Donnelly. I am the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today's webinar, Boomer Exodus, Staffing Strategies to Address the Mainframe Talent Drain, is sponsored by Insono. Today's featured speakers are Ken Harper and Christy Schroeder. Ken is a 30-plus year mainframe veteran working in the insurance, industrial, financial, and outsourcing industries. Currently, he is in Sonos product leader for mainframe services and products. He relishes being part of the high energy and thought leading in Sono leadership team that is transforming traditional mainframe outsourcing into a new type of business that's more focused on client success. Christy Schroeder has over 20 years of experience on the Z-Systems platform. From an enabling ISVs on the Z-Systems platform, managing ZOS development teams, and presenting Z-Systems hardware to clients, she's been focused on learning and building the Z ecosystem. Her current role as worldwide Z-Systems skills client leader extends that focus by educating clients on the Z-System academic initiative offerings available to help them find, build, and retain enterprise talent. With our introductions complete, Ken, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Janine. Welcome to today's webinar on the mainframe diminishing workforce. First off, I'd like to thank IBM Systems Magazine for hosting this webinar, allowing Christy and I to share our thoughts and actions around this issue. Insono is in the IT outsourcing business, headquartered in Donners Grove, Illinois, with data centers in Donners Grove, Conway, Arkansas, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Insono provides technical solutions to business issues, which includes mainframe managed services and mainframe remote infrastructure management. I am delighted today to have a panel of four mainframe millennials from Insono and IBM joining us today to give us their insights around the mainframe, how they got here, and where they are headed. So in essence, today we're going to look at the diminishing mainframe workforce from three different perspectives. In Sono, as a mainframe consumer and, con and supplier, IBM, and of course our panel of mainframe millennials. The IT workforce is changing. It's a non-technical culture and social change with a new generation of people that think and communicate different than a traditional legacy programmer. The next, gen, the next gen mainframers are highly adaptable, eager to learn, and love technology as they've grown up with it. They have an appreciation and understanding that non-technical skills are just as important with technical skill sets. And it's highly likely that those non-technical skill sets with communication, self-direction, and leadership are what got them an offer to work at Insono, IBM, or even perhaps your company. Baby boomer retirements are increasing at an accelerated rate driven by personal, economic, and business factors. It's not just a mainframe issue. The mainframe workforce demands are not going away. Continued mainframe growth, development, and integration are happening today and will only continue to scale upwards. From a business standpoint, the mainframe will continue to be a relevant IT platform on a global scale as we all try to go faster, cheaper, better, and more secure. So we'll be maintaining these critical systems. Diminishing mainframe workforce has reached critical mass. The concern from a few years ago has now evolved into the issue for today. And it's not just IT organizations that are affected. The mainframe is a thriving industry with vendors, business partners, developers, suppliers who provide services and products for, main, for the mainframe platform. The numbers from the previous slide are a gripping reminder that this has become a compelling event. Mainframes continue to play a vital role in existing and expanding IT environments. Big data analytics, high transaction volume are all, are all there on the platform. Mainframes are still the foundation and central source of data use by all major industries. The mainframe touches everyone in some shape or form, sometimes with a healthcare claim, 
checking your account balance on a mobile device, or withdrawing cash from an ATM. More than likely, that data will probably reside on a mainframe. As technology owners, we have to drive the solution that makes sense for our business. Regardless of the size and scope, operating system, or business application, the mainframe environment is just as important to you and your business. Much like the year 2K phenomenon, the talent shortage is upon us and will only continue to become more challenging. The problem is real and it's here. Mainframe support staff today are waiting on a number, a milestone birthday, a retirement account balance, and I can tell you from a personal perspective, that's not my number, or have decided that the life aspect of work-life balance is now there to take. And it's just not the technical skills that go away. The intellectual knowledge and process collateral are highly critical components that need to be transitioned. Business dynamics can generate an immediate pivot or change with regard to staff. Mergers and acquisitions always result with some impact on IT staff reductions. One dynamic Insona was seeing are companies offering early out packages that result in a majority of their staff leaving within a short period of time, putting mainframe environments at risk with mainframe support. So what are all the alternatives? Well, number one, you can move off the mainframe. This is certainly a viable solution, but for some organizations, considering the complexity, size, time, budget, and other business drivers, this is easier said than done. When you consider a fair amount of mainframe application support has been outsourced or, or in some cases um, offshored, there has been limited to no history on how these apps interact with the current environment. Another solution is development talent from within. The evolution with the mainframe over the past 40 years has eliminated many entry-level opportunities. Job role progression have, has been severely compressed. This presents a challenge for smaller mainframe shops and may be a moot point for workloads destined to be sunsetting. Internal development takes a commitment, time, and resources to develop and manage an active plan, but it's an investment that can pay off with solid dividends with continued support and strategic planning on the mainframe. Sourcing talent externally. Each day becomes more challenging to find experienced talent with supply and demand dynamics. There is a considerable amount of cost and time to hire and transition, and in some cases, incentive bonuses and relocation can only become more costly. Staff augmentation here may be a good idea, renting bodies if you are getting off the mainframe in the short term. Outsource, really two, two solutions here, managed services, and, and uh, remote infrastructure management as a service. Managed services requires labor, hardware, and software levers to make it a financial alternative. This also is time consuming and can be complex. It could be an emotional decision as well, turning over your IT environment to a third party provider. In some cases, managed services is the only solution when there is limited tribal knowledge a mainframe ma uh, manual support, and out-of-date software and hardware. That's when it's keep the lights on until the data, process, and business requirements are no longer needed. As an alternative, remote infrastructure management is a viable answer. This can be a quick tactical solution when business dynamics have accelerated timelines that impact IT, such as I mentioned before with early retirement packages. Remote infrastructure management is also a solution for moving off the mainframe. It allows for companies to develop an achievable and well thought out transition plan to another platform. RIM, as commonly called, it really focuses on the labor aspect of outsourcing and the technical support. So what's in Sonos point of view on this? It's essential to our business we have a commitment to ensure our client base is never at risk, and that includes people skills required to support the mainframe environments. We lead with the mainframe. Our clients love our customer service and partnering success. 
developing new staff is required to keep the machine working. Mainframe services are one of our primary revenue drivers, expanding our current client base as well as, as, well as adding new logos. We have to be sustainable. In Sono's mission, all, well, actually, it's the mainframe team's mission, is to continue to replenish, improve, and automate the technical support factory for our delivery teams to be successful with high levels of system availability for our clients. We would be in a precarious position trying to support our mainframe clients, let alone possess the ability to take on new mainframe clients if we did not, if we did not have a successful working plan in place. As a solution, remote infrastructure management as a service is a solution for technical staffing issues. We put some thought leadership around this three years ago for mainframe support as a service creating RIM. We signed our first dedicated RIM client over two years ago and continue a successful relationship with that client. We started to see an increasing trend the past nine months with mainframe RIM as a service and it does not appear to be slowing down. Insono now has six dedicated mainframe RIM clients, five of which closed in the last six months. And we talk about compelling events. And it's confirmation that IT leaders are now taking action. Whenever I do these presentations, I always have a favorite slide, and this will probably be mine right now. This was in Sono's approach to solving the challenge internally within our mainframe support staff. It started with an internal plan, a collective effort with engagement from all mainframe talent teams that included leadership, architecture, technical support, product, operations, and solutions. We took a three-channel approach for Insano's internal solution. Number one, hiring and developing college recruits and have been very successful with a neighbor in DeKalb, Illinois, Northern Illinois University. Number two, for our internal channel, the mainframe team developed a mentoring program for people working in the operations and monitoring teams. This allowed them opportunities to move in and step into um, opportunities working with system programmers and clients and projects. Number three, our internship program with University of Central Arkansas was kicked off this past year with UCA interns working with our mainframe teams in Conway, Arkansas. We have been good and lucky aligning succession plans with retirements. This has created opportunities for internal candidates and interns to transition to formal mainframe technical support solution, uh, positions. Our program focuses on three critical success factors. Number one, ensuring we connect the candidate with a mentor that possesses good teaming and communication skills. Number two, creating clear-cut objectives with deliverables, making sure to provide training resources as needed, whatever, as needed and whatever is required by the candidates. And number three, probably the most important, giving an assignment that the candidate owns Ownership and knowing that they are providing value at a very important are very important with building on success for that individual. With that, I'd like to turn it over from to Christy at IBM. Most of, if not all, in some of the next gen and millennial staff have taken advantage of IBM's mainframe initiatives with their schools, classes, and training. And take it away, Christy. Great. So thank you very much for that, Ken. And regarding our perspective, I agree with Ken. When he talks about the baby boomers and how they're certainly retiring, and it impacts all industries, and definitely it also impacts the mainframe industry. And we actually, there was a survey that was conducted by SHARE, and they did go out and they asked our IBM clients as well as participants from the magazine about their workforce. And you can see from the chart that within the next five years, certainly, their staff on the mainframe side, C system side, will be retiring. But an interesting statistic on the next chart is showing that while the people are retiring, the workload on that Z system is either growing or staying the same, 
of those workloads because the mainframe is so important to our clients. So this is an important message that the mainframe skills are going to be needed because the workloads are critical for our clients. Now, in addition to that, you add on to what is happening in the schools. When you talk to the college professors, they think that, yeah, we're providing all the great talent and all the right skill sets as they're coming out of college. And yet, when you talk to some of the business leaders, they're saying that, yeah, they're really not coming out with the skill sets that I need. It is requiring some sort of a mismatch. About 12 years ago, we saw that this was going to be happening and developed the IBM Z Systems Academic Initiative, where the mission is to go out and educate students about Z Systems technology and all of our operating systems, making sure that we equip schools with all the materials and the technology and all the resources that they need to teach about Z Systems, and then connecting those educators to their local businesses and in their community to encourage collaboration. And then, of course, finally, we want to make sure that we're helping our clients to employ all of these great, talented students into these jobs for internships and full-time positions. So the academic initiative focuses on the complete career path, starting even middle school into high school with teaching mainframe skills, primarily through our Master the Mainframe contest. The Master of the Mainframe contest last year alone had over 10,000 participants in it. Right now we're conducting a world championship, and the winners of that competition will actually be announced at the upcoming EDGE conference in September. You don't need any skills whatsoever to participate in it. And why it's so important, especially for our clients, is because we're producing such great talent. There are three stages to the competition. People who complete stage two and stage three end up getting a really good understanding about these systems and would be great to recruit into your companies. We also work with all the academic initiative schools, as I mentioned, providing them with the technology and the resources that they need. We also offer a Linux One community. For 90 days, people can go, in fact, I think we might have increased it to 120 days, you can now access the Linux One community and give it a try to see what our Linux One systems are all about. Another great way to build skills. Even within the colleges and even after, there are some programs that are offered for certificate programs. Marist College with the Institute for Data Center Professionals also offers such certificate programs. We also have colleges like Robert Morris University as well. And there are other fabulous schools in our academic initiative program creating talent. Throughout the life cycle, even once you graduate, now you need to bring students on board. You could leverage our global training providers. You could send people off to our technical conferences, such as SHARE that's coming up next week, or some of our educational offerings. So we're really trying to get involved at all aspects of the life cycle to build these skills. For our clients, if you wanted to get started, as you mentioned, many of you will have mainframers who are going to be retiring. You need to start developing a plan. And first and foremost, you really need to start developing relationships with some schools, whether they're in your backyard or wherever you happen to be recruiting, or if you want to start establishing and recruiting at a new school, we're here to help. Build those relationships, whether you become a guest lecturer, all of the professors would certainly welcome you into their classrooms to give an industry perspective to their students. You could and should be attending career fairs, getting the word out about the talent that you're going to need. Sponsor a technical event. Students love it. Get out there, host a hackathon, host a mini Master the Mainframe contest, bring prizes. You will definitely get students who will be interested in it, and they'll start understanding who you are and build an interest into your company. So first and foremost, you've got to build those relationships. And then start recruiting through those schools and after this presentation, this, later this week, you'll be sent different links giving you access to the information that I'm talking about. For example, with our academic initiative schools, we have a list of all the schools that participate in the program. And in addition, we've also created a Google Maps. So you could quickly enter a search onto a particular location. If you're in New Jersey and you want to see all the schools that are participating, 
you click uh, enter it into the Google Map, and you'll see all of the schools that are participating. Again, the link will provide it later this week. When it comes to finding the talent, we created a V Jobs Board that's of no cost to both the client as well as to the student. For no charge, a client would be able to post any of your jobs, whether it's an internship or whether it's a full-time position, out there onto our jobs board. It's strictly for Z-Systems job openings that are available. And then we also encourage the students who are participating in our Master the Mainframe contest or graduating from one of our academic initiative schools to post their resumes out there. So it's a nice site where we match the employer with the students on our jobs board. Again, the link will be provided. And then, of course, bringing somebody on, we have various offerings to help train employees on C systems. I really want to highlight some of our fabulous no-cost offerings that are available to help clients bring people on board. First and foremost, I stress our Master the Mainframe contest, which is a fabulous contest and, again, no experience is necessary. What people don't realize is that we offer that same exact system to clients as a learning management system. So you could bring somebody on board, get them online to the Master the Mainframe learning management system, and they could go through the three different phases of the program. Now, granted, they're not going to win the fabulous T-shirt or some of those other prizes, but they are going to learn about these systems. So it's a fabulous way to get them going. Another fabulous offering that we have is a ZOS intro and workshop. Paul Newton is the instructor for that class. He resides down in Dallas. You can either attend that class remotely or you get attended there in Dallas. Either way, we just held a class at the end of June, and Paul did a wonderful job and had over 100 people signed up for that class, and he got rave reviews on it. The next class will be offered November 11th. As soon as the registration link becomes available, we will certainly be publicizing it because it is a great way to bring people on board. Now, one thing with the content, because it is hands-on on that workshop and he covers so much detail, that he typically does keep that workshop open for a few weeks afterwards. So even though you're done with the class, you could go back, try the labs out, get more practice on COS. The next offering that I'm so thrilled about is because we've never done this before. And we worked with one of our global training providers, Interskill, who partners with Arrow, to offer 27 hours of free COBOL learning. This is only available until October 31st. We're giving it a try, and hopefully they're going to be so thrilled with the results on people signing up that we'll get them to offer another type of class next year. So we just opened this up at June, and it only goes through October, and already we've had 2,000 people sign up for it. Again, the link will be provided afterwards. I will give you a tip because they recently modified the website. Make sure when you go to enroll on that link and you'll be taken to the bottom of the page, you won't see anything listed. We're working on correcting that. You need to click on, there are three tabs. There's a instructor-led in person, instructor-led online, and then there's a self-paced. Click on the self-paced tab and that's where you'll see the link to actually take you to the registration page. So go out and try the COBOL e-learning. Another option I'll talk about is the IMS Customer Internship Program. That's not for new hires. That's more for if you have experience. It's a great way to build knowledge about IMS, meet with the subject matter experts, and build your knowledge in that area. Also, we put out a lot of YouTube videos, so feel free to go out and leverage all of those as well. I can't speak enough about all the great conferences that are out there. Send those new hires. Share, as I mentioned, is next week. They specifically have a whole session set up for people who are new to Z. It's a great way for them to network and meet people. They don't want to know that it's only people who are retiring who are working on the mainframe. So getting to these conferences and seeing all the younger faces. I was just at a Tech University event in Munich and seeing all the young people going out, hanging together, and networking was so refreshing. So get some of your new people out to these conferences. In fact, 
reach out to IBM and your sales execs or reach out to me because we really want to encourage them attending and we'll be able to get discounts for most people who are 30 and under attending these events because we really want their attendance. So keep that in mind. One other thing I'll mention, finding talent. We work very closely with a company called C Skills Corps, Ron Freskins. He goes to all of our academic initiative schools. He goes and works with all the contestants from our Master the Mainframe, especially two and three, stage two and three winners. And he vets them all. He does all the legwork for you in understanding what the qualifications are. Then he would work with a client. You would say, hey, I need two people. I need these sets of skills. And he would say, I think these are great candidates. You might want to take a look at them, interview them. So Ron, for a very, very reasonable price, will help you with finding the right talent that you need. Once you have all that talent, you want to make sure that they're keeping them. You want to make sure you're retaining them. And one of the options that we offer is a Gen Z workshop. It's a one-day workshop where we bring new hires together, preferably across different companies, so that they could meet each other. We'll try to bring some of our new IBMers with us as well. And it really is just a fun day for building relationships across the system skills by doing a lot of fun activities. So with that, I wanted to make sure that I made you aware of some of the great offerings that are available to help build these skills from middle school, high school, through college, and then afterwards, IBM is really here to help you to find, build, train, and retain that Z talent. With that, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you, Christy. So this is probably the best part of the program this afternoon, the millennial's perspective on the diminishing workforce. So today we have four, Andrew, Luis, Chris, and Louisa. And I'd like to go around um, having them all introduce themselves. So Andrew, let's start out with you. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Andrew Meister. Um, I'm a Insono employee and NIU grad. Currently I have two years of mainframe experience at Insono, uh, and currently I am a mainframe systems programmer. Luis? Hello, my name is Luis Bonilla. Right now I'm with Insono as well. Uh, I currently have two months experience, and my title is a Associate Mainframe, uh, System Mainframe Programmer. Chris. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Lowers. I work for IBM. I've been here for two years now, and I developed ZOS, a component called ZOS Unix System Services. And before that, I studied at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Okay. And hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Lisa Martinez. I previously graduated from New Paul State University here in New York. And I'm currently working in IBM, and I've been here for around a year, and I developed for COS Unix System Services. Great. Thanks, guys. So we're going to ask some questions to all the panelists. The first one, uh, and we'll start with Andrew. Did you have any prior mainframe knowledge or experience before getting hired into your position? And did you take any mainframe co uh, courses in college? Um, no, I had pro. Uh, I had no prior mainframe knowledge or experience um, outside of the uh, limited view that NIU gave us. Um, we did have some assembly courses, but um, I feel a lot of the focus, as far as main, as far as the mainframe perspective, there was extracurricular. Um, and at the time, I was a little unsure of where I wanted to go in direction. Um, so I never had a chance to take the uh, take advantage of those uh, events. Luis, what about you? Um, being a second generation mainframer, I had some knowledge about the mainframe, uh, mostly the ideas and concepts such as the power of multitasking. And as in college, there's very limited courses, uh, so the closest I came was a assembler in college. Okay, Chris. Uh, so I went to RPI, which unfortunately is not one of our academic initiative schools, but 
Uh, actually, I'd never even heard of a mainframe before I started at IBM, I'll admit it. So I kind of just jumped in the, the deep end on that one. <laughs> and for me, it's the same thing before coming to IBM. I barely knew what a mainframe was, so everything I know about the mainframe I learned here at work. Thanks, guys. W once again, your non-technical skills <laughs> were wonderful and paramount in getting you jobs into this field. The next question, what inspired you to become a mainframer? And Andrew, we'll start with you again. Um, becoming a mainframer was a huge step in uh, furthering my career for me. Uh, coming off of what I had before, which was just a, a two-year degree from a community college, I wanted to do something more in line with where I saw myself career-wise going. Uh, and that was definitely something in computer science. Um, I decided to go to a job fair at, towards the end of my semester and applied at wherever I could. Uh, and the two places that really took interest in me were CA Technologies and former Axiom currently in Sono. Uh, I decided to go with Sono because I could see myself growing there and growing into a business that looked like it had a market uh, opening up. Luis, what about you? For me, what inspired me was uh, motivation at home, as well as great learning opportunities about the mainframe and the capabilities. It, uh, I really liked the fact that you could do multitasking and what it meant to actually multitask on a mainframe, as well as software partitions and LPARs and learning such information like that really opened my eyes of what's out there and how powerful these machines really are. Great. Chris? Well, like I said earlier, I didn't really know what I was getting into when I started at IBM, but shortly after coming here and um, learning a little bit more about what I was working on, uh, I was really impressed by the scale of, of, I guess, mainframes and how prevalent they are in pretty much everything that happens around the world. Uh, that was really impressive to me and why I have stuck with it. Okay. And for me, as I mentioned, I also didn't know about the mainframe. So, but what attracted me to work on the mainframe was just that putting myself out of my comfort zone and being challenged and learn something new. And actually, before I started working at IBM, I had a previous job where I worked there for less than a year, but I was doing more of front-end web development. And I soon after working there, I realized that wasn't for me. And that's when a professor from my university, he reached out to me telling me that IBM was hiring. So I decided to send in my resume. And once I came into IBM for the interview, and I learned what the mainframe was and realized how important it was and how relevant it was for today's world and the economy, I mean, there was no reason why I would turn down working for the mainframe. And ever since, I'm really happy just learning every day. Thank you, Louisa. Next question for all the panelists. And Andrew, we'll start with you again. What is your current role today? Uh, my current role is as a mainframe systems programmer in the TSOPSIS or operating systems division here at Insono. What that entails is uh, bringing down third-party software, making sure it's compatible with the current ZOS that we're running over here at Insono on the various boxes and LPARs, and uh, bringing that to a test system, making sure it's validated there with the uh, client's configurations, and then finally executing it to the production environment where it will uh, take hold of the data that's being used by the previous version, and it will take over and run on its own from there. And then, of course, maintaining it afterwards. Okay, so it sounds like maintaining the operating system, installing and managing yeah. and, and getting ready for the next uh, next upgrade. Exactly. Good. Luis? Um, as a recap, I have been here for a couple months, and so as of now, learning about the company and going through the training process, my role is to learn the expectations and day-to-day -day requirements to support multiple tenants in an outsourcing environment. Um, so I've been learning a lot of JCL, 
um, the environments of how we move things from a lab to a testing system to a product system. So as of now, because I am so early into this um, and I am learning through this process, uh, I'm getting bits of everywhere. And so eventually I'll be able to pick my own team and somewhere I feel more comfortable. I think that's really important. One of the critical success factors we used here is the fact of getting this broad view of how mainframe support works and then finding your niche, whether it's operating system, kicks, database, or, or other other areas. So, okay, um, what about you, Chris? What's your role today? I'm a developer for ZOS, um, so I actually am writing the code to make the operating system work. Um, which is cool because I'm kind of providing the tools that uh, people at companies like Insono are actually using. So it's uh, a little bit different than than what you guys are working on, but hopefully I left some for you to say, Lisa. Yeah, for me, we actually work in the same team. And like you said, we're developing part of the COS Unix. So we implement solutions for defects, new line item, items for the next release, the current release, and learning, obviously, as well. Terrific, thank you. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to direct this question to Chris and Louise at IBM. Did you experience any stigma from friends or family when you told them you were going to be working in the mainframe environment? I actually have a really great story about this. I, so I first started working at IBM doing an internship and I did this phone interview and afterwards I was kind of thinking, cool, I, you know, I think I got a job at IBM. So I was talking to my buddies about it who are also in the computer, you know, doing computer stuff, and they were all getting internships and jobs at, like, web development um, companies and making silly apps and stuff. And so naturally, um, one of my friends said, oh, mainframe, nobody uses those anymore. And, and it was kind of ripping on me for a while about that. So after the summer ended, I come back to school and, uh, you know, we actually had talked about, like, what we did all summer. And uh, basically, you know, all my friends who had been uh, trashing the mainframe a little bit kind of ate their words when they, um, you know, realized how, how basically how they rely on a mainframe all the time to do stuff. And, yeah, it was, it was interesting. You know, then so then after that, the, the guy who was really trashing it actually became very interested in it and is always asking me questions about how stuff works and everything. And for me, well, when I started working at IBM, or actually I was going to start working at IBM, and I told my friends, they told me, anything you do, just don't work on ZOS, which that's actually what I was going to start working on. They told me how it was hard to use, hard to navigate, and of course that made me scare at the time, but it was kind of too late, and I figured what, the word, what was the words that could come out of, and so I decided to, of course, just keep working. So now what do you tell them? Now I, they know I love it. I don't stop talking about the mainframe, and every every time they go into ATM, I always tell them, oh, did you know you just touched a mainframe? So, yeah, they already know I'm really happy. Thanks, guys, and keep those conversions going of, uh, uh, you know, converting people to the mainframe side. So a question here um, to Andrew and, and Luis. Um, so what training did you receive to get on board? Um, the training that we received uh, was very hands-on um, and very uh, working with us. Uh, our, we had mentors that would work with us. Um, excuse me. It was very um, uh, very Louis rigorous. Sorry. That's okay. Luis, what about you? Um, it was a very hands-on approach, and I actually got to learn some stuff from the system, such as logging in, uh, TSO and TSOX, uh, ISPF jobs, SDSF view logs and statements, and so I'm continuing to learn as well. Those are just some of the things I covered so far in my training. Great. Thank you. And I, and I think um, from you and Andrew, um, based on what Chris and Louisa 
uh, talk about in developing ZOS, you're probably going to get their contact information very quickly as you are their cu customers. Okay, another question for all the clients. Well, and Ken, I what just wanted to point out one of the things, especially for clients on the phone who are looking at talent, as you could tell from the group of panelists that we have, none of them actually had mainframe or deep mainframe Z systems experience prior to taking any of these roles. It's so important when you go out and you recruit at these schools to look for people who just really enjoy computer science or programming or problem solving. And they are going to be excellent candidates for working on Z systems. So don't be very narrow when you go out and you do your recruiting. I certainly will encourage you to go to any of our academic initiative schools to go and search for people who do have these skills. But the fabulous talent that you're hearing today, as well as many more, if you attend a share panel discussion, you'll hear more new hires from other companies talking about their experiences and how just having that passion, passion to work on computers and really just the platform becomes irrelevant. It's just that they enjoy the work. And then once you get them on, they really enjoy it. That's a real good point, Christy. Um, it's been my experience that recruiting, um, you have to break the paradigm. You're not really hiring for a particular set of skill sets, but rather on the potential. That's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh -huh. so, so to all panels again, what have you done on the mainframe that you did not know was even possible? Andrew? Um, the things that we've done on the mainframe, uh, just in general, the power and the speed of it. Uh, I've heard, you know, um, the uh, capacity planning team talking about how many millions of processes go on every day and thousands of millions of processes. And I did not know that that much data could be worked through and, and that many transactions can go through just in a given day. Good. Luis? Um, my things were very simple, such as text editing, uh, text messaging, and JCL, as well, again, with the power and speed of the system. Got it. What about you, Chris and Louisa? Um, you know, I think Andrew really touched on the main thing for me is I'm always impressed by the, there's about a million billion things going on at any point in time on the on one of these systems, and um, I, you know I think it's impressive that the machines run nearly at 100% capacity all the time, uh, which you know is like uh, basically not at all how my laptop or any other computer works. So yeah, I'm always impressed by the technology on that. Yeah. And for me, I shortly after joining IBM, I was lucky enough to join this team as kind of a side project in where we, I collaborated with a group of experienced IBMers as long as, along with um, a group of other new hires where we took a component of COS, which is RTD. I don't know how many people are familiar with it. But what we did is that we created a mobile application to display all the output of, these, of this um, COS component into a mobile phone. So we kind of combined the mainframe and the cloud technology, like COS Connect, to display this in a user-friendly way. So I never knew it was possible to actually take something from the mainframe and put on a mobile phone, which I thought that was really cool. And getting patents out of it. Yeah, and <laughs> not just that, I was able to meet an incredible group of people, which we learned so much. Even they learned from us, too. So it was that knowledge exchange as well. And I think that's what's so great for clients when they do bring in new talent is because you have the experience of the people who have been working on the system for so long and you have the creativeness and the innovativeness and all the new technology and how they're able to work together and come up with new ideas on how to use the Z system and new applications. So it really does create such a great environment when you bring that new talent in. Okay, down to a few more questions here to our panelists, and, and these are probably very valuable to our attendees today around the webinar. 
what has made you successful, and where do you see yourself in the, in the, in the organization in the future? And Andrew, we'll start with you again. Um, I think the thing that's make, made me most successful here is simply having an open mind to learn, being receptive to uh, you know the leaders ahead of me and, and the wellspring of knowledge that they have, and being able to absorb that and apply that to how I learned in school and just doing more research, I think putting in that legwork has really put me in the place that I am now. Um, as far as where I see myself in the future, I mean, we're addressing a, a boomer exodus already. So I sort of see myself taking the, taking the place of some of the higher up members here and, and trying to walk in their shoes and, and fill their boots, so to say. Thanks. Luis? For me, so far, what's contributed to my success is having mentors, asking questions, searching the web, and as well as having that, uh, being the second generation, my father is the first generation mainframer. I get practice at home as well. <laughs> yeah. When you say practice, it almost sounded like uh, challenged a lot <laughs> from, from your dad. So Chris, uh, what about you? What made you successful and where do you see yourself growing? Well, those guys already said, but learning is a huge aspect of being successful, and it's not just learning all the, the technical skills and stuff that you got to work on, too. Um, I've learned a lot about working in a huge company and everything, and uh, just how to work with others, and networking has also been really critical for um, success for me, anyway. In uh, five years, I think you said, where do I see myself? Uh, that's a tough question, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't even know what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight, so, um, so I think sometimes stuff just uh, kind of surprises you, and I like to just take it as I go. And for me, Great. just the other guys, um, just the training I have received has truly made a difference, and mentoring, I can't extra express how important mentoring has been, not just um, here in IBM, we get a technical mentor, so having a technical mentor just to be there and help you out when you have the questions and help you achieve certain goals, that's, that was really good. And even having a career mentor and talking about careers, I'm still trying, like Chris, try, trying to figure out where I want to be and where I want to go, and that's where my career mentors play a big role. So maybe in the future, I probably would like to maybe work in another component, kind of get that overall picture of the mainframe and COS. Thanks, Louisa. And one, one final question um, that we have for our panelists today. Um, what advice would you have for employers that are trying to hire mainframe talent? Andrew? I would say um, advertising and uh, just getting, getting the representation out there. Uh, from what I saw, you know, in college and things, there's very little representation of the mainframe, and I feel that there's a lot that can be done with just showing people, hey, there are jobs here, this is a, a market that will be opening up, um, and in investing in that future. And that goes along with the Master the Mainframe program at IBM as well. To go off what Andrew was saying, um, I would say promotion and marketing, uh, show up to those hackathons, show up to those schools, offer even some of your technology where they can get hands-on experience because that's really what's going to attract them besides the concept and ideas of the mainframe. Uh, I myself got to play with a couple things, even ask Apple how do you do certain things or ask Google how do you do this at these hackathons, and that captured my interest. Um, so that, that was a huge thing for me was them showing up at these hackathons. Chris? There, there are a couple of things that I think are really critical for this. Uh, the first and the easiest one is go to the career fair. That's, uh, when I was in school anyway, that's like the main way I look for jobs is just at the career fair, and that's how I ended up at IBM. Um, second is a little more challenging is to really, uh, I think a few people probably said this earlier, is look for people that are really skilled learners really hungry for knowledge, I'd say, um, and passionate about what they do. They don't have to necessarily be computer scientists even. Uh, you know, I have a couple friends here that studied like music production and just like all sorts of other uh, design, stuff like that. And now they're working in technical jobs here at IBM and exceeding at them. 
Um, so, so something I like to say is that it's like that uh, programming is just a skill like any other. Um, you know, I, I, li I always liken this to like creative skills, like uh, a musician or an artist. If you go to somebody who's a good um, like trumpet player, for instance, and you give them a different trumpet or a different kind of horn, they'll still be able to pick it up pretty quickly. But, you know, the, the skills that they have aren't tied to the one platform necessarily. And the same is true in computer science. If someone's a good computer scientist on one platform, they'll be able to pick up a new environment and work well in it. Thank and you, yes, Chris. I, Please. Yes, I agree with Chris. I couldn't say it any better. Like I said, it's not just skills, but finding the right set of people, people that like to learn, they're hungry for knowledge, they like to put themselves out of their comfort zones. Those are the right people. Thank you. And there's so much to be said, too, for clients when you bring multiple people in because then I know we do have some recent hires within IBM. Mm -hmm. They go back and they talk to their friends about the great work that they're doing on C systems, and it excites them. And then you can really start snowballing and bringing in more people because the friends are starting to talk to other friends and telling them about the opportunities to bring in new talent. Uh, yeah, and one more point with that is hire more than one person at a time um, because then they have people hanging out with afterward. <laughs> that goes a long way. Yes, it does. Yeah, and just having yeah. someone to actually relate to, someone that's going through the same onboarding process, the same obstacles, it really makes a difference be able to relate and kind of talk about stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We've also found that pizza and malted beverages also works well. <laughs> um, if, 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 if our four if our four panelists today, Andrew, Luis, um, Chris, and Louisa are representatives of the um, new millennial mainframe workforce, I'd like to say that we're in a very, very good place. Th thank, you, thank you all to the panelists. Yeah, thank you. In conclusion, um, some bullets here. Um, mainframe skills shortages in the workforce is more than a concern. It, it certainly is a compelling event that presents risks to businesses. And hopefully, Christy and I and the panelists have given you some thought leadership on where you need to be in, in creating solutions for your own, your own shops. The shortages do exist in leadership and the SME ranks as well. It's just not the technical who are going to be the thought leaders on the mainframe in the future. There are certainly viable solutions and options to mitigate, manage, and solve the issue. The diminishing mainframe workforce should be on every ma mainframe leader's agenda and as I mentioned before, just from a business perspective, it, and Sono has seen a rise in the number of remote infrastructure management as a service offerings. Janine, how about questions okay. and answers? We do have some questions. So I'll start with this one, and Ken, I'll ask your uh, assistance in directing these to our panelists. Um, would you recommend this field, the mainframe field, to other young professionals, and why? Okay. Um, Luis looks like he wants to jump on this one. Go right ahead. Um, I say yes. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities in this field, and even learning about the computing power. Uh, that's what actually captures a lot of interest, at least for me, just being involved with a regular PC and seeing what it can do and what you could do with it as far as coding and and making software, and you could take that to the next level on the mainframe times 100 because you could have multiple users. You, you have multiple users on there, and it's complexity, and you deal with bigger issues on an enterprise level. And so there's always challenges, and if that's what somebody's looking for, this is a perfect fit for them. Thank you. Great. Um, Louisa kind of touched on, on this with her anecdote about taking mainframe information um, and converting it to mobile. But the question is, what misconceptions did you have about the mainframe before choosing it as a career? Any takers? Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, Andrew here. Um, misconceptions about the mainframe, to be honest, I, didn't, I thought it was a, a movie term. I, I had no idea it was a real thing for, for quite some time. 
you know, I'm growing up in this new generation. So uh, I wasn't able to comprehend the power at first and, and what it what it means to, to work on a mainframe and, and the amount of data it can hold. Um, so after learning that, you know, coming here and learning that, um, it was a big eye-opening experience for me. Um, here's one that I, I think is important. From an attendee, are we talking about COBOL only or RPG or assembler? Um, can you speak to that, maybe Christy or? Well, I will certainly say, no, we're not. We're talking about all of the complete enterprise system skills, which incorporates Assembler and COBOL and JCL and DD2 and IMS and pick all your favorite subsystems that go with it, along with all the new DevOps tools that we have that are employed on the system. And in addition to that, with Linux One, you now have all the Linux technology out there. So I think it's such a broad scope of skill sets. And just to add to that, this is Chris, by the way. Uh, that I think that there's a lot more than just understanding the languages for uh, someone working in a mainframe environment. Luis was talking earlier about um, you know LPARs and all the different tenancy and everything. There are tons of different concepts like that that uh, they're simply not taught in school or anything. You know they're not the standard way that um, so something like uh, you know job selection or uh, like data security. tenancy might exist. Yeah, security as well is just all vastly different on this platform. And there, so there's a ton of knowledge that goes well beyond uh, like learning the COBOL and assembler. Well, I think we could just go on um, with this topic for hours. We had a lot of interest in this webinar. We have great attendance today. So I want to thank all of you, Ken, Christy, our panelists, uh, for sharing your expertise and your experiences with us today. Um, we had a lot of requests for slides, et cetera. We are actually not going to be sending out the deck, but it, point of fact, most of the valuable information has to do with the answers and suggestions made by some of our panelists. So we will be sending a link to a recording of today's webinar um, in our email that you should be on the lookout for, as well as um, links to tons of references that Christy mentioned. Um, so please watch for that. And other than that, I want to thank everyone for attending this wonderful webinar and uh, wish you a great day. That's all. And Janine, one other plug I just want to say, you did provide the email. So certainly if you have any questions that you would like answered, I'm very open to any and all of your questions. So please feel free to give me an email. And if you're at CHAIR next week, stop by. I would certainly like to see you. I'll be at the Academic Initiative booth as well as a new hire panel discussion there. Christy, thanks. Because we didn't get to all the questions and I did forget to mention that someone will reach out to you uh, with an answer to your questions. Ken, anything where you... Uh, just about to see. Uh, no, just, like to echo, just like to echo Christy's comments, um, visit www.insono.com um, and send me an email. Also want to make a shout out to Jane Vitro, who works at Insono and put this all together for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us.